Hey everyone and welcome to our online service. And of course, it's always good to have you with us wherever you are tuning from. I want to encourage you before we continue on with our service to put away distractions, to be in a comfortable environment where you're receiving the Word of God. And let us move on to our prayer segment today. The Bible says this in Matthew 6, since we are embarking on a new series talking about the Gospels. In verse 24 to 25, the Bible says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Friends, do you realize how easily we get distracted? Especially in this age where we're being pulled in so many different directions. Every advertisement is calling for your attention. Everywhere you go, there are distractions, even on your phone. And this is the age of multitasking. You're not just doing two things at once, but three or four things. But friends, there is something that we cannot multitask. We cannot split our focus on. And that is the question, who are we ultimately serving? Who is our master? And this verse reminds us that no one can serve two masters. In other words, with our faith, with God and money in front of us, we cannot multitask. We need to focus on either one. And that's what this verse is telling us, that you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both. So the challenge here today is, friends, where does our allegiance lie? Do we love God or do we love money? Do we want to serve God or do we want to serve money? We cannot serve both God and money. And the verse goes on to say in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. I have a feeling that this text is also reminding us that the antidote for anxiety, the antidote for anxiety, that's why it goes on to say, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. The antidote is this simply, who are we serving? Are we focused on our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Messiah? Or are we focused on the distractions of this world, the pressures of this world to earn our living? And if God is our master, guess what? His yoke is easy, His burden is light. But if money is our master, friends, it will never end. Ultimately, who are we serving? Let us pray. Father, we just thank You for speaking to us today. And God, I pray that you will convict us to look at where our allegiance lies. The Lord, we're not serving, we're not trying to balance the scales and trying to serve both God and money at the same time. But Lord, we know that our devotion is unto you and you alone. God, I pray that you would shift our hearts today, shift our minds today, that we will live this life solely focused on our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to serve you. We thank you and we ask and pray all this in your name. Amen and amen. And right now, over to you, Pastor Josh, for the Word of God. Hey, everybody. Pastor Josh here. Excited to start a new series. Uh, You know, this part of the service we call Meditate, right? And so here on the online service, we're trying to help us meditate on God's Word more fully, understand it, be inspired by it. And I'm excited because uh, we're starting this month and really for the next several months on a journey through uh, one of the books of the Bible, specifically the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Why did we come to this book? Well, it's the first book of the New Testament, the New Covenant, the new thing that's happening. And that new thing is very much tied to understanding who Jesus is and what his kingdom is all about. In fact, in the very first verse, there's a lot of things happening that to uh, particularly Jewish readers, but any reader who would read these verses as Matthew writes them, would be critical to the whole history of what Christianity is really all about. It says this, this is the book of the genealogy. So it's the beginning of things, in this case of Jesus Christ. So this word Jesus is actually the word Yeshua or or, um, uh, Yeshua in, in in, in Greek, and it means God is salvation. So what are we saying from this? This guy, Jesus, this Yeshua, is the coming one who represents God's saving power coming to his people. Goes on to say he's the Christ. Now, we've often heard this word Jesus Christ as if his last name is Christ 
or it maybe is even said derogatory ways to use these two words together. Uh, but this is not his last name. It's a title and it's a reference point. Uh, if you've heard the term Messiah, it's the exact same word, Christ, the anointed one, the called one, the one uniquely gifted and graced by God for a specific calling. When we think of Messiah or Christ and the idea of anointing, it was the idea of oil being put on someone's head to appoint them for something. So when Solomon was going to be made king, they poured oil on his head. When David was going to be made king, they poured oil on his head. And the picture there was that that oil is like the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the grace of God, the empowerment of God flowing into someone's life to do something. So this is Jesus. He's our Savior. God is our Savior who is coming as this chosen vessel, this appointed vessel, this Holy Spirit vessel who's going to do certain things. He's going to be the son of David. That represented a kingdom. There was a promise to David that his son would sit on the throne forever and ever. Now, his physical line had times where they rebelled against God, and so they lost that privilege of kingship. And now we see that Jesus is coming to restore that promise of a kingdom and kingship to the line of David. And then it says he's the son of Abraham. This talks about the covenant faithfulness of God. Uh, a huge part of the understanding of God's working with the people known as Israel or the Hebrews or any of those words comes from his covenant relationship with Abraham that we see in Genesis chapter 12 and other places. His promise to bless him and to make him a blessing to all nations. So we're going to see how that plays out in the life of Jesus. He is the fulfillment of the kingdom, of the covenant promises, of God's saving power. Something new is coming that's changing the whole world for everyone. Now, it's interesting because I'm pumping you up with all this vision and excitement and going, yay, Jesus is coming. There's all these amazing things that happens. Well, the next several verses are just a list of fathers begetting sons. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez. Now, this is interesting. Judah begot Perez and Tamar. They were twins by Tamar. So this is the first time within this list, and you're going to go through, we're going to keep going through list of list of son and son and son and son. We have a, a female listed. What's particularly interesting is this woman, Tamar, had a very, it, it's in Genesis 38, if you want to look it up, she had a very difficult journey, a very painful journey in life. She was basically rejected, uh, mistreated, and her hus after her husband had passed away, mistreated by his brothers. And we see this uh, journey, we see in the life of Jesus, he's talking about his ancestors, and he unashamedly brings up this person, Tamar. And he says, hey, just because you've had a difficult past, I'm honoring and recognizing my lineage as Jesus Christ. He's saying my lineage is a lineage that's had challenges, that's had difficulties. So if you feel like maybe, you know, hey, my family line is such a mess. My name is a bad reputation in my town. Uh, the things my father or grandfathers did, I I'm embarrassed by. Jesus unashamedly communicates his ancestry. And he recognizes, hey, there's been difficulties through life, but it does not prevent the mission, the vision, and the sovereignty of God from taking place in our lives. Goes on to talk about that, Perez, and it says, Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Amminadab, Amminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon. Now, Salmon begot this guy named Boaz by Rahab. Now, some people are not sure whether that's the Rahab who's the harlot or, or it is the one reference in the book of Joshua. What's important to understand here is these two names, Rahab and Ruth, are images of people who most likely were, if not those exact people, uh, Rahab was the exact prostitute. She was someone who definitely was from a Gentile background. Uh, so if we assume it is Rahab the harlot, we assume it is Ruth who's written about in the book of Ruth. These are people who come from, they're foreigners. They're people who are grafted into the children of Israel. So again, the second and third woman listed here have histories of challenge, of suffering, of difficulty. Maybe they were people that were ostracized in their community. And yet here's God honoring them, respecting them. Goes on to talk about Obed beginning Jesse, Jesse to David the king. Then it goes on to say this, David the king begot Sol Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. This is a reference to Bathsheba. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because we're running through lines of just a genealogy. And if you're reading your Bible, you might think, wow, this is kind of boring. I don't really want to deal with this. It's interesting to me that here we see God through his word and through a genealogy affirming marriage. He doesn't like the fact that David was sleeping with someone who was someone else's wife. And he lets everybody know as much as David is a man after God's own heart and God loves David and God used David and God's continuing to show faithfulness to David and David's line. 
he still, rep- he still affirms right here, the marriage covenant is serious and David's choice has serious consequences. He still affirms that the women who had to suffer under oppression, suffer under difficult things, have a valuable place in the journey of the Messiah coming to us, of Jesus coming and saving us. Just because people misused them or hurt them did not prevent God from using them for his purposes. Summarized, these verses say this. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the captivity of Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon to Jesus or the Christ are 14 generations. What does that tell us? God is in control. So from the very beginning of the book of Matthew, what we see here is this is God's plan unfolding. Just because people made mistakes, just because you and I make mistakes, it doesn't mean God is not still Lord of the whole world. It does not mean he's still not in charge. He is still in charge. You know, we used to sing this song when we were kids, he's got the whole world in his hands. That does not change and has not changed. He is still sovereign. He is still in control. We can see it through the journey of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus isn't going to go through painful, difficult, hard things. It doesn't mean that people who fully obey God are not going to suffer for it. They do sometimes. But we can see through this journey that God's sovereignty is still playing out in history throughout even generations. Now, it goes on to talk about one last woman. It says this, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. So now we have Mary, who's one of the most honored and respected people in in Christian history. Uh, We wanna see her place within the story. It says she was betrothed to Joseph and we have a problem. Before they came together, she was found to be with child. So imagine you're in this situation, okay? Forget about religious background and us knowing the whole story and having heard of things like the Immaculate Conception and all that. You're about to get married, you're excited to get married, and all of a sudden your spouse, your future spouse, your future wife comes up to you and goes, honey, uh, good news, I'm pregnant. Uh, it's, or, and I know that could scare you, but good news, it's of the Holy Spirit. God made me pregnant. I think that would be a very difficult thing to hear. This is not something that's ever happened in history. It's not any reference point for this thing. And I want to just stop and make this note. The Holy Spirit is still active today. The Holy Spirit is still doing great and mighty and wonderful things in our lives. And one of the real challenges as we get older and more experienced and wiser in our own eyes is we can start thinking we already know how God does what God does. We already know that God can fit into our box and do things the way we think he should do them. Here we see something that completely jumped from everything people understood, even though there was a prophecy that said this very thing would happen. I don't think people were ready for the idea that a woman was supernaturally pregnant because the Holy Spirit just made her pregnant. But that's where we stand. Now, Joseph's response is very understandable. It says he was considering being a just man. He didn't want to make her a public example, public spectacle. He didn't want her punished or even potentially she could add her stone to death because they were betrothed. It's almost like she committed adultery. He, he's minded to put her away secretly. In other words, he's going to cover this up. He's like, okay, sure, it's the Holy Spirit, whatever, but I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're going we're gonna to just try to handle this in the most just way possible. So he's thinking this thing through, and behold, the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take your, you to you, marry your wife. For that which is conceived in her, and here's that word again, is of the Holy Spirit. I cannot emphasize this enough. The place of freedom in our lives, the place of genuine worship in our lives, the place of real spiritual life, real spiritual joy, real love, real anything you're looking for that's tangibly real from the power of God and the spirit of God that makes life worth living is the combination of truth that comes from God's living word and being of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God is looking for people who are worshiping him and willing to worship him in spirit and in truth. So we see here in this word, this is happening that's fulfilling prophecy. So it is truth from God, but it's empowered by God's Holy Spirit to be life and to be producing the thing God intended it to produce. So he goes on to say this, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So now we see Joseph in a very difficult moment. Imagine this, right? You're like, okay, everybody's gonna see that my betrothed is pregnant and they're gonna kinda know, they'll either think it was me or they'll think it was somebody else and either way, it's not a good thing. 
It might be embarrassing. It might be difficult. It might make people question me wrongly or misunderstand things about me. And I just want to encourage you this. If you choose to follow Jesus, if you choose to encounter his love and encounter his kingdom and encounter the things God's doing on the earth, one of the real challenges will be people will misunderstand you. So the responsibility on our end is be clear what God told us so that we're walking in the truth of what God said. The thing God said to Joseph that's so important is this part, name him Jesus. Because for you guys to carry through in your life, the thing I'm doing in your life, you need to remember that God is salvation. You need to understand that you need to speak destiny over this child. This child is not an ordinary child. This child is, a, is, is, a, is an anointed one, the Christ. This child is the son of David. This child is the son of Abraham. It's a king and it's a servant and it's a sacrifice and it's actually God. And he's coming to save the whole world. But that speaking that truth, that proclaiming of that truth by Joseph was so critical. Now, I love what the next verse says. All that was done so that uh, it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. That's the responsibility of us as followers of Christ. Actually, all of us at some measure are called to be prophets. We're supposed to speak as if God is speaking through us to this world. That's with our actions. That's with our life. That's with our love. But he said this, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and she shall bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, because this Jesus is not only the Savior and the Chosen One and all those things, he is actually God with us. This is God coming in the flesh to change the nature of the entire universe. So already within 22, 23 verses of Matthew, we've learned there's a whole story playing out here. This Messiah that, that all of the Old Testament's pointing towards and saying there's someone who's going to come and set everything right. This coming son of David who's going to be king. This opportunity for God to restore what he started in the Garden of Eden where God would become a God who's not far from us. He would be the God who is with us. He's going to save us so that we can res be restored to relationship with him. All of it's playing out in the story of this man named Jesus. God with us is the answer to every struggle we ever face. If you think about practically, what are you wrestling with today? Sometimes I'm wrestling with provision. Do I have enough? Sometimes I'm wrestling with loneliness. I, I feel like no one cares or no one's here with me. Uh, sometimes I'm wrestling with ability. I don't have enough wisdom or I don't have enough strength or I don't have enough clarity. Whichever thing I'm wrestling with, God with me. Imagine if you knew God is with you, right? It's like, it's like you're going out to play basketball and you don't know if you're good enough to beat the other team. And then you find out LeBron James and Steph Curry and I don't know who, Luka Doncic, whoever your favorite guy is, they're all on your team. And it's almost like, hey, we have the greatest guys with us. Uh, you're trying to go pay for dinner and you find out, I don't know, Jeff Bezos or whoever the richest man in the world is now and person in the world is now is with you. You don't have to worry about it so much. There's plenty of resources all around you. God is with us. That can give us confidence in this journey when life becomes difficult. So what is Joseph's response? And this is really, as we start this journey, we're going to be going through the book of Matthew and kind of seeing what Jesus did, how he lived how he brought about his kingdom, how he communicated what that kingdom was all about. And then we'll be looking at how do we respond to that? How, why does that matter to our life? How does it engage us in our moment, in our journey? I love how Joseph engaged this moment. It said, Joseph, being aroused from sleep, I'd wake up from sleep too. An angel showed up, told me my son's God, told me God's gonna come save the world. I mean, I'd, that'd wake me up too. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him took to him his wife, didn't know her until they had their son, and he called his name Jesus. He did what God told him to do. You want to experience full life. You want to experience purpose-filled life. You want to experience eternal life. Just do as the Lord commanded us. Let me summarize what I've shared today. Number one, Matthew teaches us this. He helps us to know Jesus better. So as we go through this journey, we're going to learn when we say the word Jesus, here's what we're saying. God is our salvation. He's the one who saves us. He's the one who helps us. He's the one who delivers us. I had a great conversation this week with a friend who's part of our community here in Every Nation Church, Singapore. And he I asked him the question, if you had to answer the question, who is God with one word, what would your one word be? And it was fascinating to watch almost a gleam or maybe even a tear form in his eye as he said, Savior. 
And I was like, oh man, you look like you're getting choked up. And he was like, I'm just thinking about all the times Jesus has saved me. All the things Jesus has saved me from. So when we see Jesus, we're seeing someone and we're knowing he's there to save us. He's there to rescue us. He's there to help us. He's there to grow us. And we'll learn more of that as we take this journey together. Uh, This book of Matthew helps us to understand God's kingdom more clearly. We're going to talk about that a lot more, particularly next week, but into some of the other weeks. When he begins to describe his kingdom and the character of the people in his kingdom, it's a lot of what you would not expect. So let's be ready for God to challenge some of our preconceived notions of what an abundant life looks like, what a healthy life looks like, what a kingdom life looks like. He's going to challenge some of those things as we journey together. We're going to embrace his new covenant relationship. What does that mean? We see this, you know, if you you have a Bible and you notice it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, that's that word covenant. There's a new promise, a new revelation of God's promise that he's explaining, he's showing to us, he's revealing to us. And as we understand that relationship, and we're going to take communion later, or we're going to encourage you to take communion later, that's a representation and a remembrance of this new covenant, this new thing. God is doing, and we're going to talk about what does that look like? How does that cause us to interact with God differently uh, than maybe they did in the Old Covenant? One thing you notice from the Old Testament, you had to perform and be cleansed and be concentrated and be clean enough to enter God's presence. In this new covenant, in this new relationship, in this new commitment, you come to God to get clean. Uh, we We don't become holy and then now we can know God. We go to God and he makes us holy so we can have a relationship with God. And that's what we'll be journeying uh, through together as we go through the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew reveals Jesus as several things. We talked about the, the Messiah. We're going to revisit that again and again and again, how Jesus is the answer to the prophecies that were spoken even hundreds or even a thousand years before his birth. He's the greater version of all those things we see in the Old Testament. One free note for you as you're studying your Bible, uh, you can think of it this way. Some people say the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. A lot of things written in the Old Testament are almost like symbols or images or uh, you know, uh, uh, ideas that point you towards an eventual fulfillment that comes in Jesus. So a lot of the things you see that happen in the Old Testament, you can see their fulfillment in Jesus. And we'll kind of mark some of those as we go on together. We, Matthew reveals Jesus as Savior. We've talked about that a little bit, and we'll see that more, and it'll develop more as we go through the book. And then also as Emmanuel, God with us. So we'll see that in power. We'll see that in love. We'll see that in purpose. But Matthew also challenges us, and this is where I kind of want to land, what is our response to what we see? The first thing we see, even from a genealogy, just telling us whose parents were whose parents were whose parents were whose parents, God, it's almost like God can't help himself but say, I love the rejected. I love the excluded. I love the disqualified. I love the people that you think aren't that important, and I want to bring those people into my kingdom. You know, it's interesting to me as a side note, if you go through that story, uh, there's a story in Ruth where they bless Ruth when she gets married and say, may you be blessed like Perez. Well, if you know the Tamar Perez story, it's not a very pretty story. It's a weird thing to say at a wedding. But if you track the genealogies of that, Part of the reason they say that is it pointed to uh, a prophetic answering of a prayer of the presence of God returning to the children of Israel. And it happened with their son, King David, who was the 10th son from that person, Paris. And that, there's all kinds of picture of that, and we can go through that at some point down the road. But I just want to encourage you this. God consciously, in his word, embeds it with pictures of rejected, excluded, and disqualified people being saved, being turned, being restored, being, being enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome their limitations and see God move mightily in their life. We're going to trust in God's sovereignty. You know, sometimes my problem that's in my face is so big. I, I'm doing this on purpose and freaking Mike out because he's like, oh no, they can't see your face now. My problem when it's over my face overwhelms my whole world. But actually my problem's not that big. It's just in my face. And when we learn to see the whole world is in the hands of God, we can recognize that we trust ultimately his sovereignty as we go through the challenges of life. And finally, his response, the same response Joseph had, the same response Mary had, the same response you'll see again and again in scripture that will define 
whether someone enters into God's kingdom, enters into the blessings associated with that, or misses out on God's kingdom, misses out on their day of visitation, is based on this simple thing. Do I believe? Will I obey? Now, as we've come to our close time together, uh, we'd like to take communion. And you, of course, you can do this on your own at your own time. But why we do this every week and we remind you that there's bread, uh, that's Jesus' body broken for us, is what I just said. There's a new covenant. There's a new promise. Before, if I sinned, I had to place that sin on an animal and let that animal die on my behalf. I had to spill blood of something else to cover my sins. Jesus taking the Passover meal from the Old Testament goes, let me give you a greater revelation of this Passover meal. This bread is his body broken for us. When we take it and eat it in remembrance of him, we're recognizing his body broken that our bodies might be made whole. When we take the cup and we celebrate uh, taking that wine as a picture of his blood of the new covenant, it's his blood spilled so we don't have to spill anybody else's blood anymore. His death covered all of the sins of the whole world and offered us not just covering for our sins but washing them away that we could actually be made new in new life in this new covenant relationship with Jesus. So I encourage you to take time, uh, you know, just now or in the next few minutes to do communion maybe as a family, maybe as an individual and celebrate Jesus' body broken for you, Jesus' blood spilled for you and Jesus rising from the dead three days later to show he had conquered death, conquered hell, conquered the grave. He offers new life to anyone who would believe and obey. Just go follow him. Have a great week and God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Josh, for the word. I just want to encourage you, friends. Jesus is our Messiah and Jesus is the anointed one, our Savior, that has redeemed us from death and delivered us into eternal life. And Matthew 6 goes on to say earlier from what I started off our online service with, That chapter goes on to say, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, the things of this world. But what has comforted me in this verse is this, that our Heavenly Father knows that we need them all. Friends, in our giving today, in our time of worship right now, I want to encourage you. God knows that you need them. God knows that you need certain provisions. God knows that you need a new job. God knows that we need food on our table. And God desires to be our heavenly and good Father. So even as we give today, I want to encourage you, let's put on that lens and see God for who He is. The loving Father that loves us and desires to provide for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for this opportunity to give. And God, may we not see it as a grudging obligation, but as an honour and opportunity to give back to You what You have first blessed us with. We thank you and we ask all this in your name. Amen and amen. And of course, we know how to give online. You can scan the QR code or you can visit the URL link provided. Friends, we have come to the end of our online service and I want to pray that we will encounter Jesus in the Gospels in a new and fresh way this week as you go out and make a difference that you would see Jesus at work in your workplace as well, as well as in your home. Thank you for joining us and God bless you. Lift you up